The second NTSB briefing tells us where the jet was and how it was configured. What it doesn't explain is why the crew's plan kept changing in the first few minutes after takeoff. And that matters, because the real anomaly here isn't the final approach. It's what happened before the airplane ever committed to landing. If this were a simple return, we'd expect one clean climb, one clean turn, and one stabilized setup. That's not what the data shows. Instead, the flight never quite settles. So before we talk about outcomes, we need to talk about process. Because accidents don't always begin at impact. They often begin when a flight never finds its rhythm. Let's break it down. When investigators look at early ADSB data, they're not just looking for altitude loss, they're looking for patterns. And one pattern stands out here, a repeated series of climbs and descents, not a single continuous descent, not a clean climb out followed by a return, but a profile that looks uneven, almost like the airplane is searching for a stable state and not quite finding one. It would be easy to describe that as descending, but that misses the point. What matters isn't the net change in altitude. What matters is the interruption of stabilization. In a normal departure, even with a problem, there's usually a moment where things settle down. Power is set. Pitch is established. Trim is adjusted. The airplane finds a steady rhythm. That rhythm gives the crew space to think. Here, that rhythm appears elusive. Multiple climb descent transitions suggest that the crew may have been repeatedly re-trimming the airplane, changing configuration, or responding to behavior that wasn't matching expectations. None of that implies loss of control. It implies work. It implies the crew was actively managing something that kept demanding attention. This is where it helps to introduce a concept that doesn't get talked about much outside of cockpit debriefs, what we might call procedural turbulence. Procedural turbulence isn't air turbulence, it's task turbulence. It happens when abnormal indications, ambiguous cues, or performance questions prevent a crew from ever reaching a clean, steady operating state. Instead of moving from one stable phase of flight to the next, the crew stays stuck in transition. Transitions are high workload by definition. They involve configuration changes, cross-checks, call-outs, and verification. They are manageable when they are brief. They become dangerous when they never end. And that's the key insight here. Accidents don't always start with loss of control. Sometimes they start with failure to ever regain normal rhythm. When the airplane never quite settles, neither does the crew's workload. Every second remains busy, even if nothing dramatic is happening. This matters because the crew is burning margin the entire time. Not altitude margin yet, but cognitive margin, attention margin, capacity margin. And all of this is happening before the airplane ever commits to a landing path. So when we later see a rushed setup or compressed decisions, it's worth remembering that the crew may have already been operating at elevated workload for several minutes without the relief of a stable phase in between. This section isn't about being low on approach. It's about something that came earlier, a climb that never fully resolved into something steady. Now let's talk about planning, but not in terms of runway numbers or geometry. Instead, let's talk about how many plans were in play. Early in the return, the airplane appears aligned toward one runway. Later, that plan is abandoned. Then the aircraft re-enters a different pattern for another runway. Those facts by themselves don't imply error. Crews change plans all the time. The issue isn't that the plan changed. It's how often and under what conditions. From a cognitive standpoint, what this suggests is that the crew wasn't executing a single return plan. They were replanning while airborne. Every time a plan changes, even slightly, new questions appear. Do we keep the current configuration or change it? Do we continue this turn or widen it? Do we need to rebrief? Do roles change? Does someone take the radios? Does someone monitor performance? These questions don't come one at a time. They come in clusters, and they often arrive while the airplane is already in motion, already configured, already committed to a turn. This is why decision churn matters. Each plan change adds new configuration decisions. It adds timing pressure because the airplane doesn't pause while you rethink the plan. And it adds coordination demands because both people in the cockpit need to be aligned on what the new plan actually is. What's important here is that this isn't about runway geometry or direction. It's not about whether an opposite direction landing is safe or unsafe in general. This is about decision fragmentation. When a crew has one clear plan, even a demanding one, workload can be shared and prioritized. When the plan keeps evolving, 
workload multiplies, tasks overlap, some items get deferred, others get rushed. And here's the subtle part. This can happen even if everyone is calm, professional, and well-intentioned. Plan churn increases workload faster than any checklist item ever could. Not because checklists are bad, but because replanning consumes the very resource checklists are meant to protect attention. By the time the airplane is lined up for its final attempt, the crew may already be mentally behind the airplane, not because of panic or confusion, but because they've been managing change after change without a pause to consolidate. That's why this matters for understanding the accident sequence. Not because any single plan was wrong, but because the act of repeatedly changing plans may have quietly narrowed the crew's margin long before the final moments. There's a phase of abnormal flight that rarely shows up clearly in data plots, and it often doesn't sound dramatic on cockpit recordings either. It's the space between recognizing that something isn't right and deciding what that something actually is. In this accident, that gap likely occurred very early, after liftoff, but before any stabilized return existed. And it's an important phase to understand, because it's where many well-intentioned decisions begin to narrow options instead of expanding them. After takeoff, crews don't always get a clear, unambiguous warning that says, this is the problem. More often, what they get are partial cues, a vibration that doesn't match expectations, performance that feels slightly off, control pressures that don't line up with what the pilot anticipates, maybe a parameter that's technically within limits, but trending the wrong way. None of those cues by themselves demand a specific response, and that's what makes this phase so demanding. Investigators will likely ask whether the crew was dealing with ambiguous information, signals that something had changed, without clarity on exactly what had failed or degraded. In that environment, crews often feel pressure to do something before they fully understand what they're dealing with. This is where the danger zone emerges. When action comes before classification, decisions are often framed around speed rather than structure. Returning to the airport feels like a safe, conservative move. It feels reversible, but in practice, it can commit the flight to a high workload path before roles are clearly defined, before automation is set up to help, and before the crew has had a chance to step back and ask, what problem are we actually solving? Once that path is chosen, the airplane keeps moving. Turns have to be flown, configurations have to be managed, radios still need attention, and all of this happens while the crew is still sorting out what's normal and what isn't. The key point here is not urgency. You already explored that in depth earlier. This is about timing. Early action can lock a crew into a sequence of tasks that leaves little room to slow things down later. And if that action happens before responsibilities are clearly divided, or before automation is fully engaged, task saturation can develop quietly without any obvious moment of overload. From the outside, it can look like a prompt response. From the inside, it can feel like trying to build a plan while already executing it. That's why this gap matters. Not because it proves anything yet, but because it's often where options begin to narrow long before anyone realizes they have. Now let's talk about configuration, but not as preparation for landing. Instead, let's talk about configuration as commitment. In aviation, configuration changes are often treated as neutral steps. Gear down is a step. Flaps out are steps. They're part of the flow. But in jets, configuration changes are not passive. They reshape the airplane's energy state in ways that aren't always obvious in the moment. Early use of gear or flaps increases drag. That's expected. What's less intuitive is how quickly that drag can reduce climb authority, especially if the airplane is already dealing with abnormal performance or if thrust margins are thinner than usual. Investigators will likely explore whether configuration changes occurred at a point where the airplane still needed flexibility. This isn't about accusing the crew of dirtying up too early. It's about understanding how each configuration choice may have quietly removed escape options. Once gear is down and flaps are extended, the airplane becomes more honest. It will do exactly what physics allows, and no more. If additional thrust or pitch doesn't produce the expected response, there may be no configuration left to reverse without significant altitude. This is where an important distinction comes in. A jet can be perfectly aligned with the runway. It can be perfectly under control. It can even feel stable to the crew and still be unable to arrest a descent once fully configured. That doesn't require a dramatic failure. It doesn't require loss of control. It only requires an energy state that has already been committed, with no margin left to trade. This is why configuration isn't just preparation. 
It's a decision, and like many decisions in aviation, it's one that becomes much harder or impossible to undo once made. In early analysis, investigators won't assume that configuration caused the outcome, but they will ask whether configuration timing aligned with the airplane's actual performance capability at that moment, because once configuration locks in drag, the airplane's options narrow sharply. And if that happens while the crew is still managing other tasks, recovery windows can close without any clear warning. This is not a visual illusion issue. It's not a loss of control issue. It's an energy management issue, one that can exist even when everything looks orderly. This accident won't ultimately hinge on weather, runway alignment, or even the final seconds before impact. It will hinge on how quickly complexity accumulated and how little margin remained once it did. The follow-up data won't just tell us what the airplane was doing. It will help explain how the crew's options narrowed step by step before anyone realized how constrained the situation had become. That's why early analysis matters, not to assign blame, not to guess outcomes, but to understand how reasonable decisions made under evolving conditions can quietly stack until there's very little room left to maneuver. As more information becomes available, we'll revisit this with the same discipline, separating what we know from what we think, and always keeping the focus where it belongs, learning enough to reduce the risk of the next one. Thank you for watching.